welcome to Pod Rocket. I'm Kate, the producer of Pod Rocket. With me hosting today is Noel. Hi, Noel. How's it going? Good, good. How are you, Kate? Doing well. Thanks for joining us again. And with us as guests today, we have two guests, uh, Ryan Carniato and Dylan Piercy from the Marco Dev team. Um, hi, guys. How's it going? Doing good. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for coming on. Um, so we talked to Dylan about Marco back in February, and we've talked to Ryan about SolidJS back in September. Um, and this episode's a little unique because we have invited them both on to kind of talk about web trends and stuff they've seen, you know, kind of in this space and um, working on the projects that they, they've been working on. So um, I'm excited to see how this goes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so maybe to get started, Dylan, can you just, you know, intro yourself again for our listeners if they haven't uh, listened to the, the episode from February? So, yeah, I'm mostly uh, working on Marco at eBay, which is a framework for building multi-page apps. And um, at eBay as well, we're also kind of heavily involved in the front-end ecosystem for the tools that are used there and various uh, other open source tools as well. Um, I've been working in open source for quite a while before eBay. I've been at eBay for four years, but uh, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Awesome. And yeah, Ryan, can you just give us a little a little uh, about, about you bio here? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm also working at eBay on Marco with Dylan. Um, I'm also the author of SolidJS, a different JavaScript framework. And uh, this has been great because it's given me a lot of perception, uh, kind of standing outward to see like different sides of the same coin, so to speak. It's it's um, I've been working in open source uh, for several years as well. My, at my previous startup, um, I inherited a bunch of open source projects and that's really what got me started with solid. And then I made my way to, uh, the Marco team a few years later, but, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to kind of discuss how all these pieces play together. Yeah. Um, I can, I can lead in cause I think, I think the, the main focus for us, and I think what a lot of conversations that we've been having has has been about is really this trend of moving things back to the server. Um, and that manifests in a, in a lot of different ways, but I think it's first important to realize why you would want to move things back to the server and um, how we got to this point where now essentially with Spaws, we've put everything in the browser. We've, we're sending entire applications to the browser. And one of the strengths of the, the web platform really is that we have essentially the ability to send mostly completed views to the browser and have like minimal business logic sent to the browser, right? Like if you think of web applications in the past, you could have this giant e-commerce system that essentially just sent you a little page that has, you know, all the images and all that stuff, but it didn't send you like, you know, um, the whole search functionality or it didn't send you um, how to like render all of the things. So essentially I view the web as like this like thin client mechanism, but we've taken it to the extreme now where we've got uh, the entire application being loaded in the browser. Um, so the question is, in my mind, how do you get the benefits of being able to have the application in the browser and being able to do all this complex stuff and smooth animations and, and all these things while maintaining the performance benefits of what is essentially moving some of the logic over to the server? And I think the web is kind of set up to be, in a lot of unique ways, the best platform to deliver experiences like that. And I think we're kind of on the precipice of, of making that um, seamless. Yeah, I mean, it's not an easy problem to solve. That's why people can kind of bang their heads against this for quite a few years now, because like, as you mentioned, we can send this completed view of things, but in order to remake that in the browser, um, ends up sending all that stuff twice. Actually, a lot of the considerations here is around uh, optimizing for almost duplication, actually, right? When you have a completely serialized view, you send the data twice, both as the final view and as the data you need to you know, do work in the browser. You might send the view twice, essentially, both as that HTML and as the code to re-render it. And I think almost everything that we've been looking at is can we save on that bandwidth and can we save on that execution? And these are really tricky problems that we've been circling around uh, for years, right? And it's only becoming more and more uh, prevalent, you know, of a concern as we've watched the desire for interactivity and, you know, being able to do more in the browser only increase. And it makes sense, right? Like if you want that single experience from a, like from a developer's perspective, it, it is a lot easier to kind of view your experience as 
like one single thing. You just build the app. You know, we saw this in mobile, which is largely what influenced the rise of single page apps in the first place. You just kind of come in and you have everything you need at your fingertips. And it makes the mental model to a certain degree seem easier, at least at first. But then you get all the complexities that come with the fact that you're kind of abstracting away uh, really a client server model. So I think I think it's an interesting challenge because we keep on shifting a bit, but I think one of the biggest goals and understanding, of, at least um, on the JavaScript side, because it's one of the few languages that can actually transcend uh, client server, you know, at least historically, there's new options, you know, coming out now with WebAssembly, but is that w there is this drive for a developer experience where we are maintaining a single thing. And that's why, you know, compared to maybe some views of the past, um, where, you know, we can optimize things a little easier because you have like a clear back end and front end, um, regardless of how many times we circle around the server client thing, we're really trying to, I think a lot of people's mind trying to find this universal solution, maybe the silver bullet. I, I don't know what exists, but that seems to be kind of the goal and motivation. And that's kind of driving all of the, this forward. I think you answered an interesting question that I had there that would help maybe frame this for people who are coming in from the outside who haven't been in web dev for a while, but like of why did we push all of this to the client in the first place? It almost seems counterintuitive now, like looking back at like, you know, well, of course this was maybe not the best path to tread. Um, the way that I've kind of been thinking about it is a lot like, um, you know, if you're, if you're doing something like a remote desktop application, or if you're doing like game streaming, or if you're doing like even like YouTube and all that stuff, there is so much processing that can happen in the background that makes it so that your device does not have to be as powerful, right? And like the web is really set up to, for that because you can literally send the HTML structure and styles that are able to render a certain part of the view. So since we already have this great capability to do a bunch of stuff on the server, like, Let's continue to do that. But obviously, the the draw is if you can have everything available in the browser, it's easy to um, you know add and remove things instantly. And that's kind of the, the the key, I think. The question is, if you want to do something instantly, you don't want to hit a server to do it, right? And when something's not instant, the user is going to pick up on that, and that you know obviously becomes even a bigger deal with animations and things like that. If there's an animation that's running, you don't want to hit the server to like stream the animation in. I mean, maybe if you have a really fast server and it's um, like giving you the full GUI or something like that, but you're going to be able to notice the latency. So the question is, how do you make it so that stuff that the server is going to have to do asynchronous processing on anyways happen on the server or things where it isn't going to necessarily be like, you know, the user isn't going to expect that this happens immediately. And even if the user does expect that something happens immediately, how can we opt into, you know, progressive enhancement like approaches where we can show optimistic updates and things like that? Um, so it's a, it's a tricky problem. And the, I think the, the main issue is that most tools don't really think of this dichotomy that you can have things that only happen on the server. Um, some new tools like Remix has been, you know, somewhat pioneering again, that you can have, you know, loading happen, um, on the server and certain things like that. But I think there's a huge potential for a framework to be able to say like, you know, this part of the. Uh, application can render on the server versus this other part. One example that comes to, to mind for me is if you've got like, you know, an experience like eBay where you're searching for a bunch of items, you don't expect all of those items to be available on your machine, right? Um, there's no way you're going to be able to download all of eBay to your computer. So you're going to have to hit a server in order to get um, that content. And if you're already getting the, asking the server for the content, why not ask the server for that portion of the view as well? Right, where the server can give you essentially an optimized pre-rendered uh, part of the application instead of the application having to hit some endpoint and then do the rendering client side, right? Because now you don't need to send all that rendering logic um, to the browser, which can um, improve performance. So, especially in scenarios where you're going to be doing something async and you know essentially you're asking the server for some data, instead of asking the server for some data, why don't you ask it for some portion of the view? That's one of the areas that I think is um, super interesting as far as potential futures for frameworks? From my perspective, just going back to the original question for just a second, it, it came because uh, into the, around the same time that the web got the new capabilities to uh, you know, do Ajax and get, you know, do requests and dynamically update things, 
um, in the browser, mobile came up, uh, like, you know, the iPhone and stuff, mid 2000s, 2005, 2006, around that time period. And we, they, they saw almost immediately a huge, especially on mobile devices where a lot of people live, essentially, a huge exodus from the web to just having these better native experiences. And I, I think that was a really huge push. I mean, I know it was at Facebook or Meta as they are now, but like, like they they really bet hard on you know the web, and then they're like, no, no, we're gonna do the native thing because it didn't pan out for them. But the the idea here is the web's always been trying to be this universal agnostic kind of platform, but the, we saw very quickly that people were going to these mobile apps, and I think there's a bit of envy there, and I think a lot of uh, companies and a lot of experiences really wanted to reproduce that mobile experience. That was like the biggest driver for years. We were like, if you go back to 2000, you know, 10, 11, 12, whenever, like that's what people were always talking about, like how to make everything smooth and how can we get the same kind of affordances. And um, I mean, there's reason for that too, but I think over time, you know, it's gone just from the phone to different device sizes to different things, responsive design. There's, there's been a whole bunch of evolutions in the way we view user interfaces over the same time. And I think there's maybe more flexibility, but we did learn a lot from that time period. And it was very clear that was the trajectory for a while. Like we, we wanted a more native like experience and um, that kind of got us to where we are. I mean, obviously the reality is for a while you couldn't build super high fidelity native like experiences in the web. And we're pretty close to actually being able to do that now. But um, in a lot of cases, I think the the main issue is, okay, now we've delivered this native experience to the web. Um, but these other websites over here that are, you know, serving content from the server end up being a lot faster. Why is that? How can we take advantage of that aspect of the web and apply it to um, these rich experiences? Um, yeah, and then, you know, so there's a ton of optimizations. I think pretty much every framework or most frameworks are interested in some sort of solve for this. We've seen a lot of new tools coming out recently for it. And I think a big part of it is just that we've now gotten most of the functionality that is necessary to build an actual single page application. So we're kind of rebuild or rebounding back to the point of, okay, well, how do we optimize this application? And there's obviously this like tried and true history of this is how we've optimized web pages before. Um, and how does that apply now? But it kind of turns out that it's a fairly different model. So it has some frameworks, including Marco and you know React with their server components and so on, actually rethinking the model and thinking, how can we bring some of this stuff back to the server? Because it turns out that um, in a lot of cases, the reason the web was fast is because some of that processing could happen on our beefy servers with their you know huge amounts of RAM and, and CPU, um, and we could just send the, the view to the browser or some part of the, the logic to the browser without necessarily having to have everything execute um in the browser maybe maybe we should we should talk a little bit what that looks like um now like uh th this has been going on for a while i mean marco has been experimenting in this area for since the beginning of marco that's really why it came about but um in the last couple of years we've started to see people you know others talk about this and i i think uh if we look at you know I guess 2020 sometime, um, this new term started floating around um, called uh, islands, so to speak. And I think I think that's um, it's been getting a lot of you know talk. You know, there's frameworks like uh, Astro and Slinkity and Isles, and uh, in, to a degree, Marco fits in this category, and even React server components. But this is kind of the first stab um, we've been taking at this, and it's uh, it's. It's also sometimes known as partial hydration. Um, and um, I think it's really probably a good place for us to start. Yeah, um, I think the interesting thing from the islands architecture and partial hydration is really that it starts with the acknowledgement that there is some amount of content that should only be rendered on the server. Um, it, it forces you to step back and think that there is a router on the server and you're going to send a page and then that page is going to have some amount of interactivity. Um, so it does kind of have you step back a little bit from the spa world. But within islands on the page, um, different sections of the page, you can have rich interactivity. And if that's the way that you're building your application, well, then everything outside of those islands can be server only. And this comes back to sort of what I was mentioning, where you have the server doing some amount of the work that never needs to happen in the browser, right? Um, so I, I kind of see that as like the first chip away, the first strategy as a chip away from uh, spas while being able to maintain 
um, some aspects of your application having that like super instant uh, update uh, cycle. Yeah, I mean, Astro has already kind of shown this. Uh, I know we've covered Astro on the show before, but um, they essentially let you bring almost any of your typical single page app frameworks and stick them in these islands, right? I mean, the most naive approach is like, just make you an app and go like, here's my app and stick it on the page. But you can do more than that as you break things apart. But there is one big constraint. There is the reason we call these things islands is because even though there's like the water around them, like the static stuff that never needs to update, um, they, they, they go all the way to the ground, so to speak. Like once you hit a island of interactivity, basically everything beneath it also needs to be interactive. That's kind of like the baseline. That's why it works because most, the kind of core uh, functionality or approach to um, single page apps is a sort of top down rendering approach. You, you have a, a route and then it, you know, you, it's your render call in the browser, you've seen it. And then it renders a tree essentially. And what the islands architecture lets you do is have multiple of those trees on the same page. So now suddenly you have, you know, these distinct sections that you're dealing with. And it's, you know, some people might compare it to things like maybe micro front ends or something like that, because it's basically like all these separate independent entry points. But, um, you know, the mechanisms for how we do that are kind of independent. It doesn't re necessarily require a separate service or, or whatnot. So it's not like purely the same as micro front ends. It's more just acknowledging that you have sections of the page that are interactive or stateful and other ones. And the truth is the smaller you can make those, the more um, optimal uh, the experience can be made. But, you know, the big, the big caveat here is when your app is no longer a single app, you know, the, 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 you, you can't, you're, you're kind of back in, you know, multi-page app zone for the most part, because while you could update and navigate within any of these islands, once you have it kind of distributed like this, um, you don't, you, you don't necessarily have a single top level orchestration anymore. So usually you, you're on a page, you load what you need. And then you go to the next page and you load what you need. That's kind of the experience. But I mean, for certain types of sites, categories of, you know, content site, blog sites, uh, even e-commerce, um, you get significant savings because you send way less code. We've we've observed in the islands architecture, and it's not just us with Marco, um, it's like 60 to 80, even sometimes a little bit more of bundle size reductions just because you don't need to send a bunch of that code. And it also translates to... Uh, execution savings because that code never needed to run and uh, savings in data serialization. Like if you are loading data on the server to render parts of, of your view in the, those static zones, those areas that are not interactive, well, the only data you need because you know it can never change is the data that enters those top level islands. Like basically like the top level prop that you pass into those components. So that means you can load a huge amount of data, render a bunch of static stuff, and then maybe only pass a couple of those properties into those islands. And that's all that needs to be sent to the browser. So in like in one swoop, you have the potential to, to make huge savings. But as it, the, the, this islands as we know them today are very much a manual process. You go like, here is the island. And the components don't, uh, you know, like once you're in there, you're basically back in that like single page app land. And while, as I said, this is already a huge savings and we're seeing it, it hasn't quite completed our story. It's not as optimal as we want to make it, A. And we've now kind of given up some of the benefits that we like from our single page apps. And that's why um, the work doesn't stop there. That's why there's, uh, you know, stuff like Marco and um, um, and Quick, which we haven't talked to yet about yet, but I'm sure we will through the process of this, that are actually trying to, you know, push at some other approaches here. And actually, React Server Components deserves a nod too. But, but that's some other technology and approaches we're going to work on here. I, I think it's interesting to 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 look at the islands architecture and i mean there's really two things there's yes the islands architecture is good and it has savings and all that stuff but there's the cons like ryan mentioned that you know as soon as you do have some um state or something like that something that you want to upload update at the top level of the application well now you're sending down basically the entire application and you lose a lot of the benefits of the islands architecture so the islands architecture really only works if you can force the dynamic parts of your application as low in the tree as possible. 
Um, and it's not just like moving that logic lower in the tree. It's like making components that have those logic lower in the tree. Because as Ryan said, as soon as you know one component is opted in to being an island, well, now that entire component sent to the browser. And I think the reality of most components that people are writing is there is a ton of static content in there in there, even though you know you might have some state that's driving a few different sections. Like, you know, if you think about a normal component, maybe you have like a handful of sections that are actually interpolated. Then you've got a whole bunch of divs and a whole bunch of classes and a whole bunch of you know other stuff that's largely static. So one of our questions on the Marco side and what we've been working with on Marco 6 is how do we break it down further than just like a component level? And so what we've done is essentially go in and look at per component, what are its stateful dependencies, which things can actually update and eliminate everything else. And I think that's one piece of the story, just digging in and making it so that these islands are no longer islands. They're just like the little pieces that can actually update. But then the other side of that story on the performance um, angle is that if you have any amount of hydration that's happening, and by hydration, I mean like you're re-executing stuff um, that the server did in order to get the state, you know, built up again in the browser so you can attach event handlers and, and run that stuff. If you're doing any amount of that work, you're kind of um, defeating the purpose of the server having done that exact same work. Like really the thing is, the ultimate goal is make it so that the work that the server did does not get redone in the browser, if you can. I mean, obviously there's some places where maybe that doesn't make sense, but in general, it, it seems like that's a pretty feasible goal. And so that's the other piece of what we're doing with Marco 6 is we're making it so that um, anything that you render, any data that's calculated on the server, um, we essentially serialize only the stuff that's necessary for the things that need to run in the browser, which is, like I said, those effects and event handlers. So that's kind of the two angled approach of it. You make it so that you can know how to break up these components into as small pieces as possible based off of their dependencies. Um, there are other strategies to it as well, like quick um, essentially breaks things up a little bit more manually, you have to go in and add dollar signs and it can break it up based off of events and um, stuff like that. Um, but essentially one piece is breaking it up and the other piece is making sure you're not re-executing stuff. So I think with those two things, and there's a number of approaches to get to that approximation, you've kind of solved the performance issues with islands. But then I think you need to step back and think about what the you know fundamental um, issues are, which is, you know, navigating between sections and de-opting the whole thing. So if you break things up, okay, I'll let Ryan go. Yeah, it sounds like you were just going to pull right ahead into the next topic. I, I do want to talk on this for just a moment, because um, the framing is good. And I, I, I do, I think what, in terms of just kind of stepping back in, and for people is because people have been hearing terms like islands, and they're familiar with lazy loading, right? And you know, and code splitting. And what, you, what what's happening is we're actually kind of starting to develop a new vernacular here. Like there is some new terms and ideas that Dylan just talked about. Um, and for me, it's come down to three kind of, I don't know if I want to call them definitions, but almost qualities uh, of, of hydration like strategies. Um, basically there is the uh, f like, the first thing which we've been talking about with the islands which is like the partial part like we said partial hydration like how how much do we know for certain runs only in the client versus the browser or sorry only on the server versus the the browser and like that split then there is the resumability which is the what Dylan was talking about in terms of execution uh, to what degree can we not redo work on in the browser after you've already done it on the server. Um, and then finally, um, although this hasn't been the primary concern for Marco, it's the, it's one of the ways that Quick has been doing stuff, is um, is related to that lazy loading. Like how effective are we at, um, you know, sh shipping less code? Like how much JavaScript we send? Like how progressive does it load in? So there's, as I said, there, there's these are slightly they're all related and they're kind of similar, but for me, it, it helps to look at these as kind of almost three uh, different parts of the puzzle, right? Like the knowledge of server client, one, the the uh, ability to resume or execute less in the browser, and uh, at what degree do we load that JavaScript in? And I think it, with that kind of framing coming in, it's it's kind of easier to evaluate these solutions because some of these are new new ideas. We've been doing progressive stuff in the web for a while with lazy loading. Um, and the partial stuff is the, this islands thing. 
But I think this idea of resumability and execution um, is kind of a newer idea, and it comes a lot from uh, being able to, well, use compilers, to be to be fair. Uh, a, a lot of these capabilities, um, like you, you can do partial uh, largely from being manual about it. You can go, here is an island, or you can use a compiler like we're doing Marco 6 to split those things smaller. Um, per, you know, and what we're seeing now is more and more uh, movement to say using compilation to kind of augment on the progressive side. Again, you can go lazy load this code, or in the case of something, you know, like quick, maybe the bundler and the automation in terms of compilation can make that smarter. And then, but for the third area, the resumability, the execution piece, that one um, really requires us to unwind the JavaScript code. And uh, that's, a large part why we haven't seen these improvements necessarily in existing frameworks. But um, when you put them all together, what we're talking about actually is the potential to almost eliminate what we consider hydration today. That, that's, that's, that's the bottom line. I, I know we talk about a lot of technical stuff, but if you put together what you can see is a world where we send the least amount of JavaScript because we know it runs on the client of the server. We execute only what's necessary and then we load it only as needed. And that's that's the story here because that's very different than the hydration stories that we've been telling um, thus far. You know, it, this has been the bottleneck, the uncanny valley, the thing that, uh, you know, the Chrome team sends out uh, an article every year to tell us that we're not doing good enough. Um, <laughs> like we are getting close here to kind of solving that, but they're like, even if we've mechanically solved it, there's still a lot of work to do to make the developer experience good. And still, even with this, we haven't necessarily bridged that gap to single page apps, which is what <laughs> where Dylan was heading. I just wanted to make sure this was like s- concretely cement of like w- why we're, we're thinking this way, because on the optimization side, there are solutions, but are, we're kind of tasked now with actually making those solutions usable and likable <laughs> and, and more so kind of finishing this story that, you know, has been going on for, for years now. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying, Ryan. It's almost like you've been talking about this for the past six months. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot to unwind and a lot of different areas that we're looking into as well. Like, you know, there it's it's kind of interesting that it requires, um, and I think Misco from Quick has, you know, mentioned this on Ryan's stream and stuff like that, that there's so many pieces that have to come together to make this story of continuing where the server left off actually work. But once you can do that, like there's just so much less, like just thinking about it, the amount that less that you have to do. Um, like, you know, in a single page app, you're downloading the whole application again, you're re-executing the whole application again, you're receiving all of the initial data that was needed to um, render the application again. So there's just so much obvious duplication and you can go in and measure pretty much any single page app and, and see that. And if you can get that to basically zero, which is what these strategies allow you to do, that is huge for um, the, especially the first load, but even subsequent loads if you're building a multi-page um, app. And for e-commerce and why obviously Marco is kind of exploring that, um, it, that is like our bottom line basically, right? So it's super important for that. Um, but yeah, then going into the sort of the next thing is like, okay, all of this stuff, it, it kind of, as Ryan said, solves hydration to a degree. There's a lot of complexity there, um, but we're, you know, we've hidden as much of it as we can from um, our users. But the next piece is like, what remains on the developer experience side with any of these um, kind of solutions? And I think um, a lot of it has actually been solved just because of the granularity of this approach. Like you can now with this, put some state up higher in the tree. And as long as that state doesn't re-render the entire application, like, you know, have it behind an if statement or something like that, it's going to be granular and you're not going to have to worry about your whole application being bundled. But that's where things go south, is if you do want to re-render the application where you have a router in the browser. And that's why we've been talking about making the routing happen on the server. But that does have um, some limitations, obviously. Like, how do you do a transition from page to page in an MPA? And the answer right now is you can't. Maybe there's, you know, there's specs coming up for transitions across pages, and maybe that lands, and maybe that is part of the solution for that specific problem. But in general, we want you to be able to author this experience where 
it feels a lot like you're writing an MPA. It seems like a single entry and all that stuff. Ryan's got something to say. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> the focus on routing is is really, really important here. Um, and it, I, I think you only have to look at the evolution of the, of the web to understanding how much of an impact it is. Um, the, we're we're going to talk a bit here about what we think we can do with it. But you have to understand that every time there's been a major shift in the web, it's it has kind of very quickly become about the routing, making the paradigm, right? Like we had our, you know, I mean, the web is built built off the URL in the first place, right? You have a resource location. That's the, that's the whole thing, right? So server-side routing has been with us since the beginning. When we moved to single page apps, at that point, um, now, like by definition, the, the, the change was that we were routing in the client. Some of the earliest single page apps didn't really reflect things in the URL and didn't really route, but we, we got hash state. And then f- finally our apps felt kind of like a website. And that was kind of like that first stage, that first generation of, of single page apps where you kind of route completely in the client. But as everyone knows, um, the, the hash doesn't make it to the server. Like that's something that the client gets to own. And that's why it worked really well for those first gen. But it took us getting to push state and history APIs um, so that we could actually use the URL as the server and acknowledge it. And that was key to the next generation, which is what we've been seeing now, which is we have server rendered apps that start on the server and then continue on in the client. We needed to be able to communicate that information. And essentially the routing defined the paradigm. And that's going to be true of the of the next generation of solutions here, right? If, if we acknowledge that we need, let's say, a sort of more multi-page app mentality um, here, which I don't know if that's clear to everyone why, but it, these optimizations are all based off knowing, you know, what renders on the on the uh, server and what renders on the client. And even in cases where we can be very aggressive with our lazy loading, you know, like with frameworks like Quick, we still don't want to ever just re-render everything in the browser. We don't want to load anything. So universally, we, we are looking at server rendering again, but obviously we don't want to give up what we've had in the client. And I think for, for me, at least this starts again. I mean, we, we've been looking at the optimization. It always starts with someone playing with the optimization. It was the same with single page apps. But when this becomes a reality, it's going to be because there's a routing paradigm that actually supports that. And, you know, that's what perks my interest. When I'm looking out at the wider ecosystem, thinking about what people are working on, that's what it, what's been exciting me because you can tell what when the when that paradigm shifts happening is when people start working on routing again and I, I i as a you've seen it already right like think about the way say remix is doubling down on react router this is kind of the, and and even to a degree with felt kit like this is what i consider like the pinnacle of our current methods of how we're doing stuff but if you wanted to kind of expand this a bit further out you can look at like, um, like w- I've been talking about it a lot on my stream, obviously, but like, uh, uh, I can never say his last name, but Sebastian Mark Bogge, uh, who moved from Meta to uh, um, to Next.js, he, he was tweeting some stuff uh, yesterday when he saw the Remix announcement. They just uh, mentioned that they're going to bring their loaders into their router. So like, this is kind of giving the benefits of Remix to to everyone, not even people using Remix on in the React ecosystem. He was like, yeah. This is great, but uh, well, I just keep on going. Yes, and and it's because he's you know obviously been working on the React core team. He's already kind of like a couple steps ahead in terms of where things are going. And he basically indicated that that's what he's working on. The last you know couple months, he is looking at routing again from the React core team perspective, perhaps, and looking at React server components. And I think that that this is very indicative of uh, a larger trend of us kind of moving towards what that next paradigm is. Um, so I just, just kind of put that in perspective before Dylan kind of goes on and tells you a little bit more about what we're thinking here. Um, and you know, maybe some of the different patterns that, that are happening here, because like you are starting to see this alignment first in the optimizations. Like we haven't talked about react server components very much on on the stream, but yet the thing to understand is even though they do a lot of interesting stuff that we should probably kind of mention it, especially in terms of the way that they let you have the islands and re-render what's outside of the islands, which is not a pure MPA or multi-page app kind of mentality. 
the, the way you define your islands are actually very similar to Astro or Marco four or five. Like those, they, they obey the same rules. So for that's why when we're talking about these solutions for us, they kind of all get bucketed under the same sort of thing because you you do see the common patterns. They are viewing what is stateful and what is server only with the same sort of rules, um, which might seem surprising given how wide the different solutions are that we can all actually have come to very similar conclusions. And sure, that's the optimization side, but routing is going to be the key to how we we actually get to what that next generation of uh, web framework is. Right. And I mean, with React server components, obviously routing comes into that as well. You need the router on the page that's going to communicate with your server that gives you back the data from what was rendered from the server components, right? Like essentially the way React server components works is you can set it up with your um, URL state. It'll hit the server again, re-render the server components and send VDOM to the browser that has what was rendered by the server and then diff that. The nice thing about that is you have some stuff that renders on the server. You get what is almost like HTML. It's a VDOM that gets sent down. But then you can update things in place. So you don't have this issue of like you're navigating to a new page and you've thrown everything away, right? That is one of the main limitations of MPAs in general is if you've got something like an audio player, video player that you want to persist across pages, well, you just can't do that with an MPA because you're throwing things away. So I think React has solved that fairly well. But from our perspective, we're trying to look at like, okay, we've, we've done all of this optimization from the MPA side of things. How can we maintain that? Um, optimization and what formats um, make sense. And in a lot of cases, I think, well, essentially it's more or less been proven that if you're going to a whole new page, the the fastest way you can get that page to the user is sending the HTML and the CSS with like server-side rendering or cached, right? Um, because you don't have to, yeah, basically it's TurboLink. So if you're going to a whole new um, document, the fastest thing would just be to send HTML, which I mean, like I said, with React server components, they're sending you a VDOM, which is kind of close to HTML, but you lose some of the benefits of HTML, right? Like you can't stream, maybe you can with their implementation, not 100% sure, but how are you going to diff it? So there's those kinds of considerations. But in the back of my mind, um, one of the main issues with that is that React isn't aware of what things actually persist across um, pages or what is consistent, right? So like if you have... Um, you know, a bunch of stuff rendering on the server with React server components. Say it's rendering a menu and um, and then you've got your app shell over here and that's rendering client side um, or your app body that's rendering a client side. So when you hit the server again, it's going to say, hey, render this menu or whatever. And maybe the only thing that can change in that menu as described in your JSX is like whether or not one of the, which, which page you're on, right? Like it's going to highlight the page that's on. But React server components is going to send you the entire, in the entirety of the HTML or VDOM for that section. And so one of the things that we're looking into is essentially, okay, we know which parts of the page are actually dynamic, um, which parts are derived from state, which things can actually change and how they can change. So what if we could actually have a format that's like, okay, you're visiting a page, you came from this page, what is consistent across these two pages? Oh, we see that this nav element is consistent. What is dynamic in this nav element? Okay, it's just that class, right? And then we can send just the class to the browser and do essentially a fine-grained update from that JSON format, but we skip sending so much stuff. Now, the other piece of it, like I said, though, is um, essentially if you're going to a whole new section, like say that nav was not rendered um, previously, and now it's being rendered, it was under an if statement or something like that. Um, well, now it would be ideal for the server to just send the HTML and then for your client-side runtime to be able to just pick up where it left off with this like resumability feature um, that Ryan was talking about. So that's where we're kind of seeing things going. There's a lot of questions um, still to be resolved and stuff like that. But in general, it's like, how do you navigate between pages that are consistent and preserving as much as possible while also optimizing the new page transition to the same way that MPAs have been able to do in the past? Yeah, I, I mean, MPAs uh, have traditionally been like a full page reload, right? And as we kind of uh, transition to these new uh, approaches where um, we're kind of doing sort of the routing on the server, but letting the client do the updating work so we can persist page state. Um, like the most naive approach, uh, you know, like Turbo and Turbo Links or whatever, is is just to swap the whole page out. And on the Marco side, we're, we're obviously optimizing on and looking at how we can do this at the most granular, you know, performant level. But um, the there's still a question of like, 
how much work and how how granular you want to make this work. So I think a lot of the experimentation that's happening right now is actually, um, and I think this will, will apply probably across the board to a lot of solutions, is looking to things like nested routing. Um, uh, Re- Remix has kind of popularized this form of routing again. It, 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 Ember Router back in 2012 um, was so ahead of its time. I, I, I fell in love with it back then. That's when I, when I got into Ember. And React Router 1 was like basically a complete tribute to the Ember Router. They just like, they're like, what if we took Ember Router and ported it to React? Um, somewhere along the lines around React Router 4, I think, they actually tried to streamline it to more how React user liked, would like the um, kind of experience. And they ended up cutting a bunch of stuff, um, which ended up kind of like, pushing towards different paradigms, but people really enjoyed it. And React Router is probably the most liked one. But when React Router 6 came out, they brought back all the Ember features again. And that's really, it's really powerful. I mean, for some of us, we never left that model, Um, but it's awesome to see the React ecosystem kind of get back there. And I I think it's also a logical place for us to start our exploration on the server side. Because one of the coolest things about nested routing is you've already compartmentalized your page in terms to uh, data fetching, like knowing based on this section what data I need, and like in terms of view rendering, because you might be able to leave a header or a sidebar on the page and only replace the nested part. And there's no reason why this can't apply to these server rendering techniques as a way of uh, minimizing the impact of change. There's still a lot of complexity here because, as you know, you know if you load your 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 homepage on Twitter or whatever, or your, your profile on Twitter, and you switch between your tweets and your tweets and mentions. Um, even though the, only that content in the middle changes, you know, the, you still have to update the, the selection state of like which tab you're on and all that kind of stuff. And in a client side router, router, you're just like, who cares? Client updates it. But if something was marked to be only rendered on the server, well, n- n- you, because, you know, something like that's pretty trivial for navigation. Now you're kind of in this interesting boat because it's like, how do you update server only stuff that's kind of outside of those ranges? But I think this is why there's exploration going on because we kind of innately know that things need to get more granular. And there's always this trade off when you when you try and make things more granular. You know, there's the at a cert, uh, certain level, like you know, maybe route section or island section or whatever, it's pretty easy for a developer to come in and go, this is my thing in market. But once you try and get more fine grained than that, um, it's much harder to keep track of what's going on, which um, basically, you know, kind of influences the kind of solutions and decisions you can make there, What whether you rely on diffing, like a VDOM, or whether you rely on uh, a compiler, you know, like what Marco or Svelte does. Um, and it, it's kind of a it's a challenging place to kind of work out the details, but this is this is where the work is now, right? Kind of have a mental picture of what the optimizations are, even have them working. But how do we reconcile this back into the final picture? But if you can step back and see that picture for a moment, what we're talking about here is having these optimizations. Basically, as I mentioned before, shipping only the JavaScript we need, running only what we need as we need it, like getting rid of a lot of these overheads, and yet actually navigate in the client. Like actually, like while the router is and, and the server is rendering stuff, have those transitions. You switch the tab, you know, have it fade in or crossfade or whatever you need to do just because the server renders it and the JavaScript on the, on the client can still augment those transitions, basically. So potentially a best of all world solution. But... <sighs> It comes with some stuff, and I th- I think this is this is for me at least one of the, the most challenging parts of this of this whole thing is I, I've been looking at it from different scopes, right? And and the difficulty is once you get into compiler land, you, we're talking about a whole different conversation. We're talking about l- a framework as a language. We're talking about like you know different DSLs and stuff, and people like what's familiar to them and what um, like, like they'll see stuff and just be like, Oh, hell no. Like, and, and this is, this is one of those challenges because like there's different trade-offs to different things. And one of the things is with a compiler, it's always easiest to locally optimize things like within your scope and trying to extend these optimizations out of that scope requires, you know, you know, certain concessions to the language. And I, I feel, in my opinion, where things are right now is 
we're all kind of seeing the possible solutions, but actually butting heads really hard against JavaScript, the language, and which is kind of interesting. That's why compiler just keeps on being like, you're like, oh, how do you solve that compiler? How do you solve that compiler? It's because essentially everything we're trying is kind of getting us to this point where we're like, the language isn't doing enough for us. But from a wider ecosystem step side, if, if, if you've learned JavaScript and you, you know how that works, you don't want to learn another language. So this is this is this is a this is a challenging um, space to be in because like h- how successful compilers have been so far have been based on how f- familiar they are. Svelte arguably is one of the most uh, successful at being able to get people on compiler. Right, you, you write code; it looks like JavaScript. It kind of looks like HTML. What you get is not what you're writing, but. Th- th- like don't 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 don't, you know worry about that you know and but you you, it didn't feel alien to you and i think a lot of these techniques that we're looking at right now we haven't been able to kind of bridge that gap yet because like maybe the experience does feel a bit alien because you know you want dedicated pieces to make this work and that's 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 the hardest challenge here and why like so much of this is really interesting in dx space because for me it's not clear that even if we have, say, the best quote solution, whether it could be actually adopted. You know, right? And this is true of everyone exploring the space because there's just like there's so many other elements to what people feel makes good developer experience. And this is something I've been playing with a lot myself. And I'm sorry, I'm going to kind of go on my own tangent here. But but like on the Marco side. And, you know, we've really gone, what if you had exactly the tools you meet, need to make this happen? Built to purpose. And Quick is kind of coming with the same kind of mentality where it's like, what if we just built everything from the ground up with what we know we need, uh, you know, create the syntax, create the language, create the pieces we need to make this a reality? How can, smooth can we make it? Like, how can we take care of all this stuff? And I think it accomplishes that, but... Are people going to, you know, is it unfamiliar? Are people going to accept it? Whereas, like, we haven't talked about Solid at all today because Solid really doesn't do what we're talking about, you know, in the same way React doesn't really do today what we're talking about and Celt and none of them do. But, you know, I, I've been looking at this from a, di- a different perspective kind of bet, which is like, you know, how far can we take the just JavaScript thing? Because some people kind of misconstrue Solid as a compiler. It's, it's not really, like, it, it, it does, it's not aware of, other stuff it's just primitives and it just everything can be everything's local but it gets its global composability through a runtime so it's it's not compiler first and that's i've been kind of i've been kind of riding both carts so to speak trying to figure out how is is there a future where we don't have to go all compiler in the same way and that's kind of what i've been exploring with solid and when marco said i've been like what if you just made the perfect solution with everything at your disposal? And it, 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 it's a very interesting um, kind of comparison and juxtaposition for me, at least, um, to kind of understand what those different dynamics are, because most solutions kind of try and fall somewhere in the middle. And and I don't know if the compromise is worth it. I actually think in some of these cases, you just can't solve it with the compromise. Um, and we kind of got to decide, you know, what's valuable but like as i said the promise here of what you know the stuff on this you know when we're talking about these resumability in these islands is that there is a future where you have a single tool that literally is the most optimal at any kind of site you're building we don't have that today today there's a dichotomy there's like here's a website here's an app what we're talking about here and what react server components and marco and quick like are actually moving towards is actually completely covering the whole range and that's ambitious as hell, and and it takes a, a different kind of outlook. I don't know if if everyone's ready for that, but I mean, I'm super excited to be working on it. Okay, awesome, Dylan Ryan. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, this was a fun episode. Um, we could have spent, you know, easy four hours probably here, <laughs> but. Uh, you can schedule a couple more, of course. And is there anything that you want to send our uh, listeners to um, or, you know, uh, plugs, plug your pluggables? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think, first of all, the communities on Discord are uh, completely where to go. The conversations are happening there in real time. I mean, obviously, there's stuff like Twitter, which I think you should follow um, at Ryan Carniato, Dylan Piercy, which where you can obviously see uh 
tweets and at Marco Dev team and at SolidJS. But I think Discord is the path to the future in the communities. There's always conversations. That's where that's where things are happening. Um, and beyond that, um, I, I, yeah, I'm just going to do a little shameless plug. I've been doing streams every Friday um, where I talk about a lot of the stuff. I have people like Dylan on as guests and Misko and various people. And we look at kind of the future of web dev and from a framework author's perspective. So um, yeah, definitely uh, search me up on YouTube. Uh, I'll provide the link. Yeah. Yeah. We'll include those links in the show notes. So thanks again for having us on. Awesome. Well, thanks so much you guys. And we'll see you around. Yeah.